Well, we've had the 1998 Leonid meteors. We didn't expect a meteor storm, and we didn't get one. We did get a fairly good shower. And here with the details, our meteor expert, Dr John Mason. Well, Patrick, as you say, we didn't get a storm. We were far too far from the comet's orbit for that to happen, but we did get a magnificent shower, and there were one or two surprises. Yes. If you recall, the Earth was due to pass closest to the comet's orbit at around about half past seven in the evening, mm. that's 1930 UT, on the evening of the 17th, 18th. You can see here in this graphic the orbit of the Earth, and it passes closest to the Leonid stream the night of November 17th, 18th. And we expected the activity to be either side of that time. And that didn't happen. No, it didn't. It happened much earlier. Now, I was over in India, as you know, in Darjeeling, where there was a 98% chance of clear sky, but we spent most of the time chasing clouds. <laughs> but the night before, on the night of the 16th, 17th, at about 1800 UT, that's more than 24 hours before we reached the node, we were seeing quite a few bright meteors. And as the sky got cloudier and cloudier, we were seeing bright meteors through the clouds, some of them lighting up the clouds from behind. Now, six hours later, in this country, as the Leonid radiant rose, so people began to see large numbers of bright Leonids. And this was the thing that really set this year's display apart. There was an absence of the faint Leonids mm. that we expected, but a preponderance of really bright and spectacular meteors. I suppose rates were between 200 to 300 yeah. meteors per hour for, for quite a time, fairly constant. People were seeing 80 to 100 bright meteors per hour at best. And of course, from this country, the Leonid radiant rises about half past 10 and is at its highest at around uh, 5, 6 in the morning. So people were seeing the best rates between half past 3 and half past 5 in the morning. Now we have here a magnificent set of CCD images, 12 images from Terry Platt, taken with his CCD camera with a 12 millimeter focal length f2 lens. And the 12 images are strung together as a movie. You can see here the bright fireball there occurring at 0432. And then in the following 10 minutes, the V-shaped train slowly dissipating in the upper atmosphere. There were two really bright Leonids visible from certainly the southern part of the country. One at 0429, the other at 0459 UT. I saw that one, And yeah. these were both bright enough to light up the landscape mm -hmm. and even cast shadows. And John Randall, who was observing in Selsey, took this magnificent sequence of pictures of an almost head-on Leonid, the very bright one at 0459, and the expanding train in the 10 minutes or so after the fireball occurred. And you can see it looks really like an expanding smoke ring there because of its almost head-on appearance. Now, of course, I was over in India. Um, I'd borrowed an image intensifier from Andrew Elliott and, and uh, taken it with me. We managed to get it set up despite the problems with voltage fluctuations <laughs> and frequency changes and power cuts. And I did manage to get um, quite a lot of nice bright Leonids uh, on tape. And you can see in this uh, sequence here, there are some 16 of bright Leonid meteors. Uh, one or two are exceptionally bright. And this really does show that the uh, faint meteors were absent and the bright meteors were really in preponderance. Uh, in this sh uh, sequence, the Leonid radiant is over to the left and the meteors are shooting up from left to right through Gemini and into Orion. We think that the relative absence of faint Leonids this year was because we were running through old dust, mm. not fresh yeah. dust recently laid down by the parent comet Temple Tuttle. The older a meteor stream becomes, the more of the small particles get lost and so you end up with a preponderance mm. of bright meteoroids and that's what we saw this year. Now, another surprise was the length of activity. For example, we were seeing the start of the plateau, the fairly steady level of activity, at about 1800 UT on the uh, night of the 16th. It was still going some six hours later as the radiant rose from here. It was well visible all through the early morning hours of the 17th from Britain and was going on even as dawn broke. And we can see that in these radio observations obtained by Tim Wright from Pagham in West Sussex. He was tuned to a radio transmitter in Poland, and every time a meteor occurred over the North Sea, some of the signals bounced to his receiver. Now, you can see here that before the Leonid radiant rose, activity was fairly low. But as the Leonid radiant comes up at just before 11 o'clock, so meteor activity becomes very high indeed. And every single one of these spikes is a meteor occurring over the North Sea. And you can see that the activity goes on into the early morning hours, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, after daylight, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 
and it continues right through until about midday on the 17th, where it begins to die down. And so on maximum, the expected maximum night, the 17th, 18th of November, activity was by then fairly low, no more than 30 to 40 metres per hour at best. And so it was really over much earlier than we expected, a long plateau, 16 to 18 hours long, and the midpoint of that was 14 to 16 hours before the node crossing. Well, on the night of the 17th, I was completely clouded out, unfortunately, because other people did see something, but certainly the storm, the shower was much earlier than we expected. Now, why do you think that was? Well, I think it's because we were a long way outside the comet's orbit. We were running into older debris. It's been moved out of the comet's orbital plane by perturbations, and so that's why it occurred much earlier than we expected. As to what will happen next year, yes. it's difficult to say. I'm sure we will get a very respectable shower, at least as good as this year's, perhaps better. Whether we will just get the plateau or whether we will get a spike of enhanced activity within that, I really don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. And one thing but I'm quite sure about, we must start washing the next year well ahead of time. Yes, we obviously need to go out the night before the expected peak. The next year it's the 17th, 18th yet again, but we need to go out the night of the 16th, 17th as well to make sure if it does occur early that it's not missed. Or even the night of the 15th, certainly I will. <laughs> John, we just hope for clear skies next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. So much for the Leonids. One or two news notes. As we know, the International Space Station has been started, and here's the launch of the first Russian component, Zarya. And this time, that went off without a hitch. Now being joined by the Unity, the second part, the first NASA part, and that is what's being joined up now. So let's hope for great things there. Meanwhile, don't forget the great telescopes. The VLT, or Very Large Telescope in Chile, sending back superb pictures. Look at this area, the star-forming region in the Milky Way. And remember, they're so far using only one of the four eight-meter mirrors. And don't forget the Hubble Space Telescope, still doing magnificent work. And here, the Hubble Southern Deep Field, showing galaxies more than 12 and a half thousand million light years away. We are now reaching out into the far depths of the universe. Last month, we talked about the Royal Greenwich Observatory, how it was founded as a navigational aid, finding your local time, done by observing the positions of the sun, moon, and stars. And you know, basically, that is still true today. There are two things you got to bear in mind, the Earth's rotation and its movement around the sun. And timekeeping by the stars is a very, very ancient science. In medieval times, people built things called nocturnals, and you can make one for yourself, and it's great fun. But at this stage, I'm delighted to welcome our most famous astronomical historian, Dr. Alan Chapman. Welcome, Alan. Good evening, Patrick. It's a great pleasure to be here. First of all, what exactly is a nocturnal? A nocturnal is a star clock, and the earliest surviving ones go back to about the 15th century. And they were usually by soldiers, by sailors, and by travelers, and people who needed to tell the time at night, perhaps without needing to strike a light to read something with. And they were, in fact, the first and the most direct form of star clock. Well, perhaps it's time for a quick reminder. The Earth spins round once in roughly 24 hours, and northward, the axis points to the north pole of the sky, marked within one degree by the fairly bright star, Polaris, in Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. Easily found by using the two pointers and the Great Bear, they show the way straight to Polaris. And the Great Bear is so near the pole star that it never sets over Britain. It's what's called circumpolar. And because the Earth turns, the stars appear to move across the sky, and take a time exposure, like this one, 30 minutes, and you'll see the star trails there. Lucky we have got a bright pole star. In the southern hemisphere of the heaven, there's no bright south pole star. But we are lucky in the north. And therefore, the nocturnal depends upon using the two pointers as a kind of clock hand. Absolutely. In fact, the instrument consists of a handle which mounts a main scale, which is divided into the 12 months of the year. And it's very important to make the instrument work correctly, to start the instrument off with the 5th of March absolutely at the top. Why March the 5th particularly? Well, this is caused by the precession of the equinoxes. And it just so happens that where we are in time, March the 5th suits the date. But if you'd have been around in the days of the ancient Egyptians or in the days of Julius Caesar, it would have been a different date. You mentioned precession. Well, as the Earth spins, the axis alters its direction slightly because of the pulls of the sun and moon, and it goes round like a boy's gyroscope that's starting to topple. 
But of course, a gyroscope precesses, goes right round in a few seconds, and the Earth takes 25,000 years. Yes, and of course, this means, therefore, that if you put March the 5th at the top, the instrument will actually be useful for about 100 years. But it wouldn't be, for instance, in two or 300 years. Then, in addition to the plate of months, one has a plate of hours. And this plate has to cover the maximum hours of winter darkness from 4 o'clock on a winter's afternoon to 8 o'clock on a winter's morning, and with midnight always shown as a large tongue in the middle. Traditionally, the instrument had points for the hours so that you could read it by night by touch. And then on top of that is a tail or an alidade, which is used as a pointer on the pointers of the great bear. And then right through the whole instrument, a hollow rivet so that you can look through it at the pole star. Is that difficult? It's very easy to use, very easy to make as well. Right, well, can you show us how the nocturnal works? Before starting an observation, you adjust the long tongue to correspond with whichever particular date in the year we currently happen to be at. And then you wedge it fairly fast with a bit of wood or a bit of cardboard or something like that. Then you hold it up to your eye and you notice in the center of the instrument is a hollow rivet. And you look through that hollow rivet at Polaris. And then when you've got it adjusted, you turn the long handle or what is called technically the alidade until it corresponds with the pointers of the great bear. And when you've seen that, you notice, of course, that they will be on the inside, or the long side of the alidade pointing to the pearl star. It will correspond to one of the notches. And that will either be a notch before or a notch after midnight, and that will give you the time. And with a bit of practice, you can tell the time to within about a quarter of an hour. Well, um, please, um, can we have a practical demonstration? By all means, Patrick. One takes the instrument, first of all, and rotates the long midnight pointer until it con corresponds to the appropriate date of the year. And now, of course, for convenience, it's divided into five-day intervals. But let's say we're calling it today's date, 13th of December. You turn and put that tong on the 13th of December. You could wedge it with something, a bit of cardboard, or hold it with your finger. But make sure you've got it in the right position. Then you go outside and you find the pearl star and you look through the hollow rivet in the middle of the instrument at the pole star in that position. Then, keeping the pole star in view, you move it away from your eye to about that distance, about a foot away from your face, until you can see quite conveniently the pole star. And then you turn this point, bearing in mind, of course, you have to keep it completely vertical. You then turn that alidade until it corresponds with the pole star and corresponds with the pointers of the great bear. And if that's what you have in that position, there you've got it. Trap the device with your thumb in that manner. Run your finger along the edge, bearing in mind you're doing this in the dark. You find one point there. Once you've got that point, remove the alidade, and you find that you are one notch after midnight. One o'clock in the morning. Is it rather difficult to keep the pole star in view through that tiny notch? Uh, with practice, it comes right easy. Uh, in fact, when you bear in mind that people like Copernicus and Tycho Brahe were looking at the pole star through much, much tinier holes than that and getting quite critical measurements. And with practice, you can do it. In fact, you can see the pole star quite accurately through a pinhole, merely a pinhole at about two feet from the eye with practice. Well, now then, uh, you say we can make one? Let's make one. Absolutely. Let's try that. We start of all with a piece of white paper and then take a pair of compasses and open to a dimension which will give you about just under a four inch circle. Stick the point into the paper and draw your circle. Then take a compass and ruler and using the centre of the circle draw a line across. This is classical geometry. Then take the same radius and you can divide it exactly six times. You can then bisect that angle, which of course is then 60 degrees. And then join up each of those lines. What you've now got is a circle divided into the 12 months of the year. If you then draw a smaller circle, and this circle will be about three inches 
in diameter. When you've drawn the smaller circle, you then take the next stage in the development, where you divide it around the edge into 24, which, of course, you can do exactly by the same technique of dividing into 12, but just divide each one further. And then, on the circle, you can work out a series of points. Now, we've done this beforehand, and we've worked out a series of parts. So if you then make the instrument onto a sheet of paper like that and cut it out, the part we've just shown is this one, where you have all the months shown with March the 5th at the top, and with the hours of maximum winter darkness in here, you then cut out the tail, or the alidade, whereby the instrument has a pointer, so that one goes on top of the other, and this eventually onto there. But to make a hollow rivet, that's the problem. Now, one of the ways in which you can make a hollow rivet is to take a piece of thin paper, take a nail, about a three or four inch nail, fairly good diameter, wrap it around like that, Take a strip of sticky tape. There you've got a hollow rivet, a simple hollow rivet. Now, what we've done already is to then take these parts and stick them onto a piece of thick card, and then cut them out. When you've cut them out, they take on a nice, solid, rigid form. And then all you have to do is to put them together. Insert the rivet, then take the hour scale, then take the alidade, and you can perhaps just solidify this slightly by something like a bit of plasticine or blue tack, just at top and bottom, and there you have your working nocturnal. Alan, thank you very much, and I wonder how many people are going to make nocturnals for themselves. Um, if you'd like Alan's fact sheet showing you how to make a nocturnal, then send a large stamped address envelope marked Nocturnal to The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London, W12 7TS. And the best of luck. Don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical information, then dial up our Sky and Information Line, 0891 800 330, or CFAX, page 620. You know, I'm looking forward to next year. There is so much going to happen. The new probes to Mars, the space station, great new telescopes, the Leonids, the transit of Mercury, and, of course, the total eclipse of the sun, and much else besides. I mean, so much going on now. For example, next month, I'll be joined by Ian Morrison. We're going to talk about communicating with other worlds. So, roll on, 1999. And meanwhile, since this is our last sky at night of 1998, it may not be too early for me to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Good night. When somebody's threatening to kill you.